Good morning, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. So if you could please take your seats. Good morning and welcome. I'm uh, Ceci Echeverria. I'm executive director with the Institute for Health Policy. Um, and on behalf of the Institute and Government Relations and Kaiser Permanente, I'd like to welcome you to today's forum. Today's forum is the fourth forum that we've held. Um, we've had um, a few now on um, mental health issues. We've had one on telehealth and one on drug pricing. And we will continue to hold these conversations um, into next year as well. We're really excited to do that on behalf of Kaiser Permanente. So before we get started, I'd like to do a little bit of housekeeping. So restrooms for folks that haven't yet had to use them are down the hall. There's another little hall and then to the left. So um, please make sure to feel free to get up at any point and use the restrooms as you need. Um, the exits today in case of an emergency are right behind us at the back of the room. So please exit where you entered um, in case we need to evacuate for whatever reason. Um, but on, on another note, um, today's topic, uh, addressing trauma in school-aged children, is a tough topic to talk about. It's a tough topic to listen um, to stories about, and we want to make sure that you're able to take care of yourself and your needs during today's conversation. So we've done a couple of things differently for this forum than in the past that I'll uh, share with you today. The first is that we have set up a lounge in the back of the room across from where breakfast is being served. And that lounge is for quiet reflection, for folks that need to take uh, you know, a step away from the content if necessary, um, and um, you know, give yourself some time to, um, to really think about the issues and think about how you're feeling about them. We um, encourage you, if you have a phone call, not to use that room. That room is for the quiet reflection. One of the other things we've done today is that we have um, asked a Kaiser Permanente social worker, Erin Van Leuven. Erin, are you here? Erin's in the back of the room. Erin is available to connect with anybody that feels like they just need um, to talk to someone today. Um, many of us come to this work with our own experiences of trauma, and we may be triggered by part of the conversation today. So Erin is a resource, as are the Institute for Health Policy staff. So Institute staff have a blue pin on their lapel. So can I have um, Institute staff please um, raise your hands and let everybody know who you are? So if at any point during the day folks need to connect with someone, are looking for resources, maybe looking for Aaron, um, please connect with anyone that has a blue lapel pin so that we're able to help meet your needs today. We are also hoping to make sure that today is interactive and that there are ample opportunities for you to ask questions of our speakers. We have a really wonderful agenda plan for everybody today, and we're trying to make sure that everybody has a chance to ask questions if, if they come up. So please take advantage of those opportunities. You'll notice that we do have mics in the room. There's um, a few mics over here by the screens. So please feel free to make sure to use those mics throughout the day. Use the notebooks and the pen on the table, please, to track your thoughts um, and make note of your questions. Another note is in the folders, you do have a survey, and we are hoping that you will take time today before you leave to fill out the survey. We use this information to help inform our future planning and to learn what we did well as well as what we need to improve moving forward. So please feel free to use the, the survey. You can leave it on your table at the end of the day, or you can pass it along to anyone with a blue pin. Um, on your table, you'll also note that um, we are having this conversation on Twitter. And we encourage you, if you use Twitter, to use the hashtags on the table. That's um, hashtag trauma informed and hashtag KPIHP to track the conversation and share your thoughts. Um, we will be um, sharing a lot of information, not just today, 
but in the future as sort of we wrap up this event. So please make note of that, and we look forward to hearing your thoughts throughout the day on Twitter. Um, the Center for Total Health also offers tours of the facility. You may see that there's um, an exhibit here. Um, please let us know if you're interested in a tour of the center, and we can make sure to connect you with the right people to do that. Um, lunch will be available at noon today, so um, just a note um, for everybody. And then again, a reminder, the folks with blue pins are here to help. So please make sure to reach out to us if there's anything you need to help make your time with us a little more comfortable. So now with all of the housekeeping out of the way, I'd like to invite Don and Tony um, to come up. And while you're doing that, I'm going to tell the audience a little bit about you. So Don Mordecai is the Kaiser Permanente National Leader for Mental Health and Wellness and Director of Mental Health and Chemical Dependency Services for the Permanente Medical Group in Northern California. Prior to these roles, Don was Chief of Psychiatry and Chief of Health Promotion for Kaiser Permanente San Jose Medical Center. He trained at Stanford as a child and adolescent and adult psychiatrist. His clinical work is with patients with developmental disorders, ADHD, and the range of general psychiatric psychiatry issues. Um, Tony Beretta is Senior Vice President of Government Relations for Kaiser Permanente. He oversees Kaiser Permanente's legislative and regulatory policy efforts, leading a team of legislative advocates and policy professionals in Oakland, Sacramento, and DC. He directs development of Kaiser Permanente's public policy positions in collaboration with our senior leadership to ensure that Kaiser Permanente maintains a common voice in support of the organization, its members, and the communities we serve. So thank you, Don and Tony. Thank you, Ceci. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm, Good tempted, morning, Don. I'm tempted to do what our CEO likes to do, which is like, Come on, people. Good morning, everyone. Um, I won't do that to you. Um, so uh, I just want to welcome everyone here, uh, the, the colleagues, as well as partners from many of the organizations that we have the pleasure of working with at Kaiser Permanente. And uh, I just wanted to start things off with a short video just to kind of ground us as to you know, what we're talking about, get, get some voices in our head, in a sense, about um, this issue of, of trauma in childhood and its potential impact. So if we could have the youth radio video. I was eight years old, asleep in the top bunk of my bed when I heard guys yelling outside my house. Then pop, 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 and a bullet came smashing through my window, landing in the wall just inches above my head. After that night, I started sleeping on the bottom bunk, but that wasn't the only change. It was kind of like my innocence was taken away. I stopped playing outside like I used to because I carried fear of getting hurt. I started paying attention to the noises outside my house and wherever I went. I listened for any angry voices or people yelling at each other because arguments can escalate quickly into violence. I continue to hear gunshots near my house and it makes me uncomfortable. My main fear is that one of my family members, not just me, could be in danger. Instead of feeling fear all the time, I decided that it's better to have a plan in mind to deal with shootings. At home, Instead of doing fire drills, I had my little sisters practice what to do if there was another shooting. I told them to find a place to hide, like under a bed, to lay down on the floor and call 911 if possible. But this 4th of July made me wonder how often my little sister thinks about gun violence. When firecrackers went off, she ran under the bed and laid on the floor. She was terrified. It took me right back to when the bullet came through my window as a kid. Seeing the fear on my sister's face reminded me just how scared I was that night. Now I wonder whether or not it's foolish to think there's any way to prepare for the terror of guns. So uh, Youth Radio is a, an organization based in Oakland, California. Many of you probably heard Youth Radio stories on NPR, uh, a great organization. And I just want us to keep that, that child's voice in our heads as we go. 
um, thinking about trauma suffered in the home, thinking about trauma brought to us in our communities, um, things like that as, as we talk. So uh, we obviously live in a time of increased awareness of the impact of childhood trauma. You hear things like toxic stress or adverse childhood experiences. Uh, you know, Oprah did a piece on 60 Minutes recently that, that brought forward this issue. So that's a good thing, right? And we're all part of that increased awareness. Um, the original adverse childhood experiences study was actually done in Kaiser Permanente in Southern California uh, about 20 years ago. Uh, and it involved uh, 17,000 Kaiser Permanente adult members who one would not consider traumatized particularly, right? Uh, they were largely middle class, uh, employed, insured people. But one of the most important things that I think the study brought out is how common trauma is in our society. Uh, and this is trauma that can affect us across the lifespan, which was one of the other key findings of this study is it's not, oh, it happened in childhood and it's over. It's more like it happened in childhood and, it, and it's still reverberating. Um, and that kind of trauma that can affect people over the lifespan is common, all too common. It's as common as divorce or separation of parents. It's as common as parents who have a substance use disorder. It's as common as neglect. Um, and then there are, of course, the other issues, the more dramatic issues that we know about, physical abuse, sexual abuse, incarceration of a parent, things like that, which are also all too common in our society. Uh, the ACEs study, the Adverse Childhood Experiences study, was incredibly simple. It basically asked these 17,000 people how many of these 10 types of trauma, and, and by the way, they were all uh, sort of domestic trauma. It wasn't about communities and other types of trauma that we've learned about subsequently. And basically said, how many of these have you had? And the number that you'd had was your score. Um, my score would be two, um, and I feel fortunate for that. Uh, because a lot of people have scores that are much higher, um, scores of four or six. But to get across how common these things are, 70% of adults, 70% of us, have at least a score of one. About 12% in this sample had a score of four or more. And there are populations where it's a lot higher than 12%. And what this study found, crucially, was that there's essentially a dose-response relationship between the number of traumas you've had as a child and certain key health outcomes, physical health outcomes, as well as mental health outcomes. So we're not, this is not just about mental health here, and I want to emphasize that too. Um, so it's not like, oh, if I've had one up to three, I'm OK, and then four and above is a problem, right? Any amount of trauma has a detectable impact. And the findings were startling to me. So not only are they common, but the downstream impacts that go on throughout the lifespan are profound. If you've had four or more traumas, you had twice the likelihood of heart disease, twice the likelihood of stroke, seven times the likelihood of a substance use disorder, seven times, 12 times the likelihood of uh, making a suicide attempt, 12 times. So that dose-response relationship was incredibly strong and incredibly profound. Um, and I would argue that it is possible and maybe even likely that the public health crises that we're talking a lot about today, um, or I mean, you know, in, in the world today, the, the increase in suicide uh, in almost all demographics, including children, very sadly, the opioid epidemic, uh, are probably directly correlated with trauma suffered in childhood. So Kaiser Permanente is dedicated to improving the health of our members and the communities we serve. And if we want to move upstream and address these issues at their root, we have to think about trauma, right? That's why we're here today. Um, and in doing that, we have to think about not only how do we prevent traumas in the first place, of course, primary prevention, but also secondary prevention. What can we do to help kids who have been traumatized and then even adults, right? How do we help the adults who suffered these things as children? And it's an emerging field. I wish I could say, oh, we, you know, we've got all the answers, we just have to implement. In fact, we know some things that work, we need to know a lot more. Um, so how do we get there? How do we create homes and communities that are nurturing and healing and not traumatizing? 
Uh, our search for solutions has led Kaiser Permanente to invest nearly $9 million over the past four years in programs to address and prevent trauma. A lot of our work has been focused on schools. Uh, so we have a thriving schools program. Uh, we have something called Resilience in School Environments, or RISE, that you're going to hear about later today. Uh, and these are our, our, our sort of putting our marker down to say, we think schools are, are a unique place, a social home, if you will, where we can have an impact on these issues. So you're gonna he you'll hear more about those programs later. So with that introduction, I'd like to turn things over to Tony Beretta, as you heard, our Senior Vice President for Government Relations. So um, thanks, Don. Um, I actually think it's incredibly helpful to ground the conversation in the science behind, um, um, behind trauma and how it affects health. Um, one, of, you know, one of the issues um, that I think is critical to focus on is exactly what Don reflected, which was while we know some of the science behind this, the interventions and what to do about it are still being learned. Um, and in, indeed, we are constantly looking within Kaiser Permanente for ways to address what we know is a major problem in society. Um, the ACES study for me um, came to life in part, I, I was aware of it as a policy professional within Kaiser Permanente for over 20 years, um, but it wasn't until um, when I was sitting on the board of directors for the East Bay Agency for Children, their CEO Josh Leonard's here today, um, when there was a very specific focus on trauma and the need to organize around trauma through EBAC programs to figure out how to get upstream and how to provide the support for the people in the schools and in the clinics who are taking care of these children. And what was what I noticed, it was at that time that I first read the ACEs study and I, would, I had the same reaction. I was like, wow, this is super basic stuff um, and super obvious stuff. And in the public policy space um, and being responsible for public policy for Kaiser Permanente, I often find my role is clearing away you know, all of the chaff because most public policy should be quite simple. And th this is an area in which I think taking a simple approach, having good understanding and excellent dialogue among the many people who are working on these issues can help us refine and bring forward appropriate policy solutions. And so that's what I'm hoping to do today is to listen to all of you who are participating in this to learn more about this subject. That's the reason why we're um, putting on these forums. Um, I'll note that mental health in general um, is one of the key initiatives that we have brought forward as public policy professionals within Kaiser Permanente, along with the problems of drug pricing, universal coverage, and at, frankly, telehealth in terms of creating better access. But mental health has been an area in which we really have wanted to focus over the last two years, and I fully expect we'll continue to do that because it is in this mental health space that we can start to bring together how people live their lives and how it affects health, and this is probably where many of the interventions are. So I look very much forward to the conversation today. I get to do some reflecting at the end, so I'll be listening closely and taking some notes. Um, but Ceci, thanks for pulling all this together and turning back to you. Thank you. Um, so before we get started um, with uh, Dr. Dorado, who's our first speaker, um, I want to take us to some polling. So you may have noticed that on your table, there's instructions to participate in a poll. Um, so please take a look at that. You can pull out your cell phone and it's as easy as sending a text. So the question that we're asking is, which topics would you like us to cover today? So we know we have um, speakers lined up and they have an idea of what they'll be presenting, but it would be great to know a little bit about what you would like to hear about. So please take a few seconds um, and text what topics you would like us to cover today and we'll start to see that populated. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Keep them coming. So solutions seems like a big one. 
vicarious is up there, school-based strategies, solutions still sort of the big one, um, public, public health. Great, thank you. Policy, equity. Thank you. These are some great responses. Um, so I think for some of our speakers that are already in the room, um, we'd love for you to sort of take note of some of these concepts and as, uh, to the extent possible, see if you're able to address some of those in your comments. Um, and then we'll check back in with a poll later today.